Mass spectrometry is a novel analytical technique that uses some interesting properties of electrons and of the force formulas in physics in order to help you separate and identify compounds based on the masses of their various components. Usually you'll use this for organic compounds, but it can be used for other things. And so first, before we go into interpreting mass spec data, we'll go through and understand the theoretical basis of how mass spectrometry works. And the first step that you have is when you have a sample containing a lot of different molecules of your unknown, you shoot an electron beam through that sample, a fairly concentrated electron beam. And what that will do is that will break bonds and produce different components or different pieces with a charge of plus one. And so perhaps you might see if this is our unknown, we might break a bond like this and each of these components will have a plus one charge. This will be plus one and so will that. And because you have so many different molecules, you'll get all sorts of combinations, including one that is the entire molecule except for one proton. And the other one, which will be the smallest piece we have, is just a proton. It's, it's only a hydrogen. And so at the end, we'll have a lot of different pieces of this compound, all of which have a plus one charge. And they all have the same charge, which means that they'll behave in quite the same way in an electrical system. And so now that we've formed all these different components, perhaps we have a component that's an OH group with a positive charge, perhaps we have something that's only this tert butyl group with a positive charge, and we'll have all of the different pieces, then what we'll do is we'll find some way to accelerate all of these cations down this path. And so they'll all be accelerated down a path like this, and they'll all be moving straight in one direction along this path. And the next step is that they will encounter a magnetic field that is produced by an external magnet. And so in order to understand the physics of this, I'll move to the other side and we'll go through how the right hand rule dictates the behavior of the plus one charged cations as they're traveling down. And so remembering that the right hand rule involves three components using this formula for the magnetic force. You have B, you have F, and you have V for the velocity. Index finger is B, the middle finger is F for the force, and the thumb is V for the velocity. So it's in alphabetical order, B, F, and V. And remembering that our velocity is this way, and if we create a magnetic field that's moving in the upward direction, what you'll notice is that the force will be moving out toward you. And as a result, that force will be exerted on all of these little cations, and whenever a uh, force encounters something that has mass, the object with mass will accelerate according to F equals MA. And so certain components will be able to accelerate perfectly along this curved path so that they meet the receiver or detector. If at that exact moment the magnetic field is too strong, then it will put too much of an acceleration force on it and it will accelerate into this wall and not reach the receiver. And if the magnetic field isn't strong enough, then the force won't cause it to curve sufficiently and it will run into this wall and thus not meet the receiver. And so realize that because all of these have a charge of plus one, they're going to experience the same force if they're in the same magnetic field. Because the magnetic force equals Q, which is the charge, times the velocity, times B, which is your magnetic field force, and sine theta, which is irrelevant because we're only using right angles in this situation. But realize that it doesn't care about the mass of the compound as much as it cares about its velocity, and all of these different compounds will have the same velocity and the same charge. And so that means that if they experience a magnetic force, a field, then they will all experience the same magnetic force there. What's different is that because some are more massive than the others, some will accelerate very, very slowly, 
because the same force, if you have a very high mass, your acceleration will be rather low under the same force. And so it will not curve enough and it will run into this wall. Others, if you have a small mass but the same force, then the acceleration will be too great and it will run into this wall and not meet the receiver. So mass spectrometry takes advantage of the interesting interplay between the charge and the mass with these two different forces. Because the charge is the same for all of these different components, the large ones and the small ones, all have a cationic charge of plus one, they will experience the exact same force when they're within the exact same magnetic field and undergoing the same velocity. And so these two things are definitely happening. The charge is going to be the same and the velocity will be the same. And if we keep the magnetic field strength constant, then they will experience the same magnetic force no matter what. However, that magnetic force will only be sufficient to accelerate certain pieces of this along that ideal path to where it hits the receiver. And what this means is that for larger mass components, you will need to have a larger force in order to get the same acceleration of them. So the smallest ones, your proton, for example, with a mass number of one, will accelerate along this perfectly curved path at a very low magnetic field strength because it won't take much force to move a small mass over that acceleration. And then as the pieces get bigger and bigger, it's going to require a larger and larger magnetic field in order to move them along this curved path. And so you start from zero and you increase the strength of that magnetic field from zero up to the level where it's going to be able to move the proton and accelerate it along this curved path. And then as you continue to increase that field, larger and larger pieces, perhaps a tert butyl group, perhaps a hydroxyl group, perhaps a very large group consisting of the entire compound other than maybe a methyl group or something like that. As you increase the strength of this magnetic field, the cations that are hitting the receiver will be more and more massive. And so that means that the strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the mass of the component of our compound that is recording that event. And that allows us to get to something called the mass to charge ratio, M over Z, which is something you might encounter when you're dealing with mass spectrometry. Z is the charge, and the charge will always be one for any of these cations that we produce by shooting that electron beam through the sample. And the mass to charge ratio will vary depending on how massive the compound is. So you'll have a small mass to charge ratio when you're dealing with just protons, and that will be the smallest magnetic field strength that records any event whatsoever at our detector or receiver. The proton will require a very, very small magnetic field strength. And then you continue to increase the strength of that magnetic field until all of these different components, perhaps a methyl group with a charge of plus one, perhaps everything but that methyl group, which will also have a charge of plus one. As you increase the strength of this magnetic field, you'll produce the exact force necessary to curve larger and larger compounds until they reach the detector, until you get to the point where your entire compound other than one hydrogen is going to be hitting your receiver. And that will be the largest event that you record. And then you'll be able to analyze all of these different components on your mass spectrometry data. And so next we'll go through the data. But the key thing is to realize that as you increase the strength of the magnetic field, the compound or the piece of the compound that's recording that event is getting larger and larger. And then we'll be able to analyze it and look at how we can read all of this data in order to figure out what our exact compound is that we're running through the mass spectrometer.